we need to start acting now if, if we're going to make some serious changes in, in how cities work, right? There is time to make change, uh, but it's not going to happen by just talking about what might happen in the future on Twitter, right? Um, we need proactive programs that incentivize people changing the way that they move around a city and we need to make it a sensible choice for them right you can't just tell people to go get on a bike you can't just put some paint down and expect it to get used um, you can't build infrastructure and then not take care of it all four seasons uh, or let it deteriorate hey everyone welcome to the active towns channel i'm john Summerman, and that was dave edwards chief operating officer of nearby a Toronto-based e-cargo bike logistical company. And uh, Dave is actually a recommendation from you, some of our audience members, uh, and I really do appreciate hearing from you. So if you do have a topic that you'd like me to cover on the profiles videos or a, an individual that you think would make a good uh, guest on the podcast, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. Uh, you can do that in, in comments uh, for these videos as well as uh, drop me an email. And that uh, email address is john at activetowns.org. Dave has a truly fascinating story, so let's get right to it. I hope you enjoy it. Dave Edwards from Toronto. Welcome, Dave. Uh, uh, thanks, John. Uh, pleasure to be here. So, Dave, why don't we do this? Why don't you uh, just take a quick moment to introduce yourself uh, to the audience? Oh, hi. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, my name is Dave Edwards. Uh, I live in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I am currently the COO of a e-cargo bike delivery company uh, called Nearby. Uh, I'm a cycling advocate, safe streets advocate, and uh, I guess recreational uh, urbanist uh, and uh, maybe uh, a little bit too addicted to uh, bike Twitter and social media. <laughs> bike Twitter and social media. And I think that's originally how I, I discovered you was was out yeah. on bike Twitter, um, uh, you know, just kind of monitoring what's kind of going on out there. And so uh, we you know, th that was most likely how, because I know that um, when our mutual friend, um, uh, Brandon Lust, the uh, American Feaster, when he, uh, you know, yeah. suggested that I get you onto the podcast, I was like, I, I yeah, no, I, I know Dave, I, I do. He's, he, he's out <laughs> right. on bike Twitter. And your, and your handle, of course, on bike Twitter is, uh, is, or out there in Twitter is, in fact, uh, Dave Likes Bikes. So at yeah. Dave, Dave Likes Bikes. And uh, I think it's actually a great place for us to start this uh, conversation off because the, the pinned tweet that you have at the top of your page here mm. is, uh, is uh, basically two wonderful photos of you and your girlfriend. And it looks like you're getting ready to go out for an evening. And the text basically <laughs> says, you can't get dressed up and go out for dinner on a bike. You know? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just so cool. And, and I, and I love these photos that the two of you have here. Um, and it, it, I love it too. Cause you're posed in front of a, an area there and it's like nicely color coordinated. <laughs> yeah. So and you know what, John, like, I, I, I swear none of that was planned at all. Um, that was over this summer when, um, some of the lockdown restrictions that we had in Toronto started to ease, um, right. you know, historically myself and my girlfriend, that's Arianne, um, we, we do like to get dressed up and, uh -huh. and, and go out for dinner once in a while um, in, in regular times. And we hadn't been able to do that for a while. And uh, I mean, you know, uh, like, like in a lot of cities, uh, we got somewhere, there was a long lineup, a bit of an extra wait to get in uh, during that time. And yeah. we just happened to be by this little park and the, uh, you know, the color was great and, uh, and we had our bike. So there you go. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So, and, and I, and I, let's, I'm going to go back over to this cause I just love it so much. It, what I really love about this, this whole concept of, of getting dressed up and, and going out and, and doing that is it, it, it really emphasizes the fact that a lot of the preconceptions that people have about riding a bike, um, and the things that come to mind when you think about, oh, yeah. yeah, no, I ride a bike or I cycle or we rode to dinner. They may not think of this. And that's why I love that so much is it, it just kind of takes all of those stereotype uh, things when you say, oh, yeah, no, I'm a bike advocate and I like to ride a bike. It, it throws them out. 
Um, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a, a little bit of your evolution, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think uh, I often feel a little bit strange even describing myself as a bike advocate. Uh, I, I think really at the end of the day is uh, I'm a person who rides a bike, right? right. I'm lots of things, right? Yeah. I have a job, yeah. I have a family. I like baseball, yeah. you know, uh, and I also happen to uh, ride a bike to most places that I need to go. But it certainly wasn't always like that. And I see the photo that you bring up here. This is, um, yeah, this has got to be like, like, this is three, four years ago um, when I was still kind of a very occasional recreational cyclist. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'd kind of always had a bike. And I rode it when the weather was nice. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'd commute to work couple times a week if it was perfect, uh, perfect conditions. Um, and, you know, October, November would roll around up here in Canada and it's time to put the bike away. Right. Uh, you know, I never imagined I, I could go grocery shopping, uh, that I could wear everyday clothes, like getting on a bike was an event, right? right I had right. to get dressed a certain way and get my gear and, and get ready to go. It wasn't really just something that was part of my life. Yeah. So you mentioned you, you might commute to work on occasion. Um, what was your career uh, at that time? Yeah, so I worked uh, for a large financial institution here in Canada for okay. um, almost uh, just about 20 years, uh, d operations, different, uh, different areas in the corporate world for the bank. Yeah, yeah. So this was 2019. I think it was in, in June of 2019 that this uh, mm -hmm. photo came around. Uh, what happened in July of 2019? <laughs> right. We went to the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, my goodness, I mean, I had an idea of what that might look like. Uh, you know, you talk about Twitter. Uh, almost everything that I've gotten into since then has has come from from seeing it on Twitter and uh, what what other places might look like. And, you know, we didn't go there just because of this, but it was certainly a um, a, a big reason why yeah. and 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 going there i mean listen i'm the, i'm that 10,000th person to talk about it on a cycling podcast probably but uh, it is absolutely mind blowing like i will never look at a city uh, in, in the same way uh, for the rest of my life um, it is it it is just it is so different it 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 is it, it's so different it's so quiet it's so peaceful but there's so much going on and um yeah, this actually, I remember taking this photo here. You know, we were on vacation. We weren't there to take pictures of bikes. And uh, the amount of times that I was like, no, we just need 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes at this intersection uh, so I can watch these thousands of pe people uh, cycle by and take pictures with my phone. I mean, I just, I couldn't get enough. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. get enough. And, you know, I, as you can see, when you go through those pictures, right, it's, it, it's, it, it, there's no specific type of person that's on a bike, right? It's, it's kids, it's elderly people. Uh, it, it really is just everyone. And, and I, I guarantee you, none of these people that are on these bikes are thinking, oh, wow, I'm on a bike, right? right. Yeah. It's just, it's just what everybody does. Yeah, 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 it's, that's a good point. And nor are they thinking, I'm a cyclist. Right. Right, yeah. you know, they're just a, a, a person who, who, who gets out on a bike. And um, now with this particular photo, um, yeah. is this still in the Netherlands or is this back home? No, that that's uh, that is outside of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Oh, that's okay. on our uh, the yeah. day before we went home. Yeah, that was just uh, that was a nice long ride out in the countryside. Yeah. Um, but you know what? What that brings to mind is uh, I'm going to say it wrong. I'm going to. It's the Panute system, I think it's called, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, a network of um, cycling highways throughout rural areas uh, right. in the Netherlands yeah. um, that are uh, numbered, uh, you know, so you can get your directions of how to get from A to B by just a set of numbers. And uh, that was a super hot day. That was yeah. a really hot day. And we're out in the countryside, and you see people in suits and dresses uh, riding to work. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fantastic. Yeah, you're right. And what's really, really amazing about um, the the networks that they have together, or, or really when you look at the just the land use pattern and the fact that then you do have a, a cycling network in the city, but then you also have 
a network of um, facilities that then connect village to village, city to city, town to town. And so you yep. are able to, to very, very quickly be able to get past the city limits and then you're in countryside just like this. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just fantastic. It, 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 it's unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. All right. Um, so then things start to happen. Um, uh, eventually, you know, you guys come home now. I, I don't know. Is this, is this still in the Netherlands or is this home? No, this, this is back home shortly after we got back yeah. uh, from the trip. Yeah. Fantastic. We, uh, yeah. So this is, this is funny. I have a lot of pictures of my girlfriend in here. Yeah. Um, so Ariane again, but, um, when I met her, uh, probably about a year before that, um, she didn't own a bike and I had one. Okay. Um, prior to going to the Netherlands, actually it was a, it was a trip to New York city that, that kind of got her hooked and using their city bike. Um, ah, bike yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so upright, uh, yeah. step through, uh, easy to ride bikes with fenders and racks, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that kind of started to influence our travel habits of, of looking for cities. Um, not so we could bike, but so we could see the city easily and right. biking, it turns out is, you know, maybe the best way to do that. So, so that photo is a bike we had, uh, she had purchased, uh, before we went away and had just arrived when we got back from the Netherlands. And, uh, that's when she started to, you know, she likes to wear a nice dress and that's when she started to uh, do her commuting in her everyday clothes. Well, and, and, and one of the, you know, I'm going to go head back over to that photo. Um, one of the great things about this is that it being over there in the Netherlands just reinforced that you can just yep. wear everyday clothes. You don't have to necessarily be donned out in, you know, in cycling specific, you know, clothing. You cert you yeah. certainly can do that if that's more comfortable sure. for the type of riding that you're doing or the length of, of your ride. Um, but yep. you don't have to if you're if you're yeah. You know, if your trip is relatively short and, you know, you're exactly. in a situation where, yeah, you're you're able to uh, and feel comfortable dressing for your destination versus dressing for the journey. So I was just I was just going to use that exact same quote. That's yeah. a great one. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it is one of the, the favorite uh, quotes that we use frequently especially mm -hmm. out on by Twitter. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm fast forwarding over to this particular image because this is a little different than most people would expect to see. What uh -huh. happened in, in 2021 where you, you were suddenly on uh, this type of bike? Yeah, uh, boy, I'm so influenced by Twitter. Uh, you, you know, um, <laughs> The proliferation of cargo bikes in North America is something that I got really excited about um, after seeing, um, you know, every fourth bike, it seemed like in the Netherlands was a cargo bike of some sort. And uh, I started to get really interested in it. And, uh, you know, um, I like to sort of expand what I was doing with my bike, you know, in, in that interim period of, of grocery shopping, going to the hardware store, that sort of thing. And I'm going to give a lot of credit here to, to Brandon Lust uh, for being a big influence in that regard um, with his, um, he's got uh, a work cycles freight with a gigantic, massive rack on the front. And I became enamored with that bike. And I, I really tried to uh, buy one. They're not available here in Canada. Long story short, I was about to buy one uh, straight from the Netherlands and I had to talk to a local bike store here about uh, some accessories for it. And I ended up with this uh, that I got here in Toronto. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a Reese and Mueller uh, Load 60, it's called. Um, and this bike has, uh, it's, it's really it's really been life changing. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I, I don't know, you know, you know I, I sometimes introduce it as my midlife crisis bike. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not a red Corvette. Uh, it's it's not inexpensive. I still have to, you know, it took me a lot of time to, um, you know, sort of get comfortable with with the price of bikes like this. Right. Right. Um, and, and I think that really, you know, gets into my head as, as a, or what I had to get into my head is I, I, I think as a as a culture in North America, you know, looking at these things as vehicle replacements. So I can't compare, you know, a bike like this to, you know, the single speed that I have in my basement. Right. I've got to think about what would an SUV cost? Cause I use right. this bike as I, as I would use an SUV. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way to do it. The, and, and you're really drawing the comparison to the, this bike brand new is like kind of a tired used car, <laughs> you know, SUV. Absolutely. you know, it's, yep. it, it's nowhere near, it's a fraction of the cost of a new SUV, yep. but sure. you you know, it, it definitely is, you know, it's more expensive than your typical, um, you know, bike that's out there. Um, yeah. but yeah, talk about, talk about a wonderful bike. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> this, it, many people may not know much about this particular brand. It is a German brand. Um, mm -hmm. this particular bike also has a uh, rear shock absorption too. So you have a nice smooth yeah. ride there. It's electric assist, obviously. Um, yeah. So you're talking about a utilitarian uh, tool right there. It, it really is. Uh, I'm not a huge bike specs guy. I mm -hmm. certainly know enough about my bike to explain it sure. a little bit. Uh, for sure. Like, like you mentioned, it has the rear suspension. It also yeah. has uh, front suspension. So I, I believe it's the only dual suspension uh, electric cargo bike that's available right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's got a hundred kilogram capacity in that box there. Right. Um, you can buy this bike in any sort of customizable um, configuration that you want. So you can have it with no box, with a tarp, uh, different lengths. There, there's all sorts of different ways you can you can use this bike. But uh, so that's a that's a lockable box on that. Which you know, speaking about being utilitarian, I can go shopping. I, I live in a very dense part of Toronto. Uh, I can go up to a main street like we have here called Danforth Avenue, and you know we can hit eight different little stores to buy our groceries and lock up in between, right? And not right. worry about theft, that sort of thing. Right. Or, you know, my own personal belongings can go in there as well. So it right. makes it very, very functional. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, it's got two batteries. It's got the, you know, electrical assist. So I, I can get, I've never done 200, but I'm supposed to be able to get about 200 kilometers uh, okay. on a single charge between those things. So I have ridden it as, you know, over a hundred K in a day. Okay. Uh, I'll say this, it, it's a lot of bike. That's for sure. Um, you know, things like suspension, I, I thought of that as kind of bells and whistles um, when I got the bike. But I tell you, you know, I don't live in the Netherlands. I live in Toronto. Yeah. We have awful roads. We've got potholes everywhere. <laughs> Our bike lanes are full of like just it's we do not have smooth riding here. I'm, uh, so I, I'm, I I'm, cr I'm cracking ahead. up right now. I'm really laughing a lot right now because um, You've mentioned uh, Brandon Lust a, a couple of times, and, and of course, I've mm -hmm. interviewed his wife, uh, Tatiana. Mm -hmm. And yeah. during the interview, during the episode, we had a, a little clip of her riding in the Urban Arrow, and, and the thing that comes out is, oh, this needs suspension. And at that oh, time, yeah. I didn't know yeah. that this bike had suspension. <laughs> and so I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you, well, you, you, you know, could very well. It's, it's comfortable, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but along with comfort, yeah. you know, and this is really important to me too, yeah. along with comfort comes safety, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, I don't get bounced around, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if I'm on a hill going down a hill at 30, 35 K and, and I hit a pothole, I don't get that big jarring yeah. wobble, you know, potential for moving out of my lane. Uh, it's just one less thing to, to worry about. So, you know, while it seemed yeah. a bit excessive when I bought it, it's, yeah. it's actual, it makes my ride a lot safer. Well, and, and, and more importantly too, is that because of that additional level of comfort, there is a um, a very very important aspect to that is that you're just more likely to use it more, you know. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So I mean, there, there yeah. is very. It's not just you know for fun and not just for your know, comfort. You know, in in, yeah. in air quotes there. It's like, yeah, it just makes it more likely that you're going to ride and use it for more errands, uh, more mm -hmm. frequently. So, it definitely does. We've we've had a we've had a very difficult winter this year in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and 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 you're right. Like I, I I wouldn't ride this. I wouldn't ride other bikes as, as often in in conditions that I ride this bike for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that was in in, in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. 2020, so you were there in the Netherlands in 2019 and 2020, things are, are, are moving along and you're starting to, you know, this stuff is starting to settle in. Um, mm -hmm. When was the career change? Well, it's just about a year ago now, okay. uh, almost um, once about 11 months ago. Okay. Right. So I, I uh, 
So I'm in my mid forties. I'm 44. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's again, we could call it a midlife crisis, or we could look at it in a different way. Um, I I had my son when I was 23. Okay. Uh, working in a bank was not the life goal. Right. Uh, working in a bank was the necessity of being a young parent. Right. I needed yeah, a job. Absolutely. Yeah. I got a job. I was thankful for it. Um, I, I would not say. Uh, I would not say I, I was very fulfilled by it, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I was grateful to have it. And, you know, the, the place I worked for treated me well for a number of years. Um, but I just, I just, my heart was just not in it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get to a certain point of, um, I don't know, I, it's, it, it was not a rash decision. Basically I got to a point where, you know, if you, I, I, I had taken on quite a bit of responsibility in, in my role. Uh, I had a number of people reporting to me. Um, and if you're, your heart's not in it, you're, you're, you're yeah. not going to give, give those people what they need. Yeah. Right. Um, so w during the pandemic, like most people, we moved to a work from home setting or sorry, not like most people, like, like a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, we moved to a work from home setting. And, and for me, it took away, um, it took away my bike commute. Uh, uh, but it took away yeah. my my social interaction with people, and with and people that's too. what yeah. I did like about my job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I I just I just took a I took a many months of thinking about it, and um, you know on good terms I I resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, I resigned my role. Um, I'm lucky enough uh, to be in a, a position where I was able to do that without great stress. Right. Uh, I'm not retired, yeah. uh, but I didn't have a I didn't have a real plan. Yeah. Uh, but I was determined uh, to sort of barge my way into finding a way that I could earn some sort of living um, in cities or in the cycling industry or just something in that world. I just needed I just needed to be I needed it to be more a part of my life than just tweeting about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then along comes <laughs> this image. Yeah. So. You, you had mentioned it earlier. You're you're now currently the COO of of this yeah. organization, um, chief operating officer. For the, those folks yeah. who may not be a, aware of that acronym, um, how did this come about? How sure. did how did this how did this start and materialize? So I, I left work probably. I guess it was actually right at right in April of last year. And uh, I, I was working on a number of different ideas, uh, working on some different business ventures with other people in Toronto. And uh, to be honest, I was looking, helping my, my teenager find a job. Okay. And I came across an ad for uh, a new startup company in my neck of the woods here in Toronto um, that was doing delivery by e-cargo bike. And okay. uh, I just lit up. I'm, you know, I, I, I reached out to them immediately. Um, I kind of thought of it as my, uh, my Walmart greeter job, right? Yeah, like yeah. this was, this isn't a career move uh, for right. me. Um, but it's literally, they were operating from right around the corner from where I live. And uh, I'm really into it, <laughs> obviously. Now, did um, you already have the, the, the Reese, uh, the cargo bike? No. Oh, um, no, it was on order. It, it was, was on order. order. It so you had already yet. made the decision. It. So you yeah. were already all in on this whole cargo bike thing. And then this yeah. materialized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I did this part time through last summer. So a couple okay. of days a week, I, I, I became in, I became a bike courier uh, in, in this bike. Well, we, we have some other models as well, but yeah. yeah, I think this was actually my first day, my first day on the job. <laughs> I, uh, I swung by home, make sure I got a picture. All right, so you've you've made this change. You're you're over there. Mm -hmm. You're doing some fun stuff. Um, so you start out as as just kind of, you know, getting out there doing it, um, yep. and then it materializes into something else, right? Yeah. So I certainly had this in the back of my head that maybe there was something I could offer this organization more than you know part time delivery person. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was very happy to do what I was doing. Uh, yeah. But yeah, after a number of months, it became obvious that I could probably help out in some other ways. Right. Um, I do do a lot of, you know, whether it be social media, I have some other um, photography skills that I put to use on Instagram. Uh, and I mean, I did run operations at a major financial institution. So so I had some good background in, in some different areas. 
Uh, and you know, the, this, this, uh, this company was started by, yeah, it's my two current partners, but Ivan Weisbluth and Nick Aguinarius, they, um, they came up with the idea. Like I'm not the founder, they're the founders. Uh, but they obviously knew what they were doing. Uh, and they were very passionate about what they were doing. And, and eventually they approached me about, uh, taking on a bigger role in the company and, uh, becoming, you know, uh, an additional owner, uh, and, and partner along with them. Nice. Nice. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a neat story, really, like how it came about. Um, one of my partners, Ivan, is, uh, he, he is the, um, he's an owner of uh, a chain of uh, small, independent, organic butcher shops here in Toronto. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, they had a delivery van. Uh, uh, and they okay. would move all their product from store to store. They have four locations around Toronto. And he... He himself is a, a cargo bike owner. He's got a couple young kids. Uh, he moves his kids around by cargo bike. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was frustrated by the cost and limitations of a van. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, so uh, yeah, he, he, he started this out of a need uh, right. for his own business. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to pull up the website in just a moment. But I, I, I moved to this photo so that we could get sure. a, a pull, pull back a little bit and, and get... Uh, an idea of the scale of, of the particular bike and be able to get a sense of the, that cargo uh, carrying capacity and what better than a comparison to a, a, a big ship here. <laughs> and uh, But then, you know, it's like this opens up and you can fit a lot of stuff in here. So, I mean, the practicality of it is, is pretty impressive. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and you need to see it, right? Like I can tell people, you know, it holds 850 liters uh, of capacity or uh, I think, sorry, the, uh, the combined weight capacity of the bike is close to 450 pounds. It's kind of hard to, uh, to really know what that means uh, in, in, until you see it. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> this, is, uh, this is from earlier today. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was messing around cleaning up the shop uh, uh, before the podcast. And, uh, actually I'll, I'll say, John, uh, I don't know if you'd leave this in, but for a brief moment, uh, earlier in the week, I had a thought, you know, you said you needed a really quiet place for me to do the podcast. And there was a brief moment where I was like, can I do it inside the bike? Ooh, uh, Hey, that would have been cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's a, that, that's, I actually, I got in there today cause I wanted to see what it actually looked like, uh, yeah. from the inside. Uh, but yeah, you, you can, you can fit a ton in there. Um, it, yeah. it's uh it, it's fantastic <laughs> um you know we do i'm sure you have some pictures of it there too so so that bike there that's called a it's a centaur is the brand name comes from mm-hmm. netherlands uh it's a pro trike xl so obviously it's a it's a three-wheeled bicycle it's very stable can hold a ton of weight uh but we've got another bike uh, another model of bike that we use which actually is the larger part of our fleet mm-hmm. or will be soon uh which is called a trio bike uh, which comes out of Denmark. Okay. Um, and that's the two wheeled, uh, bicycle with the very large box on the front. Right. Um, yeah. This, yeah. this one. Here. Yeah. 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 There it is. Yeah. Uh, another great bike. It's got about half the volume capacity, but moves much quicker, uh, rides much more like a normal bicycle. Right. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, but they each have, they each have their they each have their uses and their specialties. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're we're a new company and we're we're figuring out which one works best for what we do. Well, let's pull up the website here. Let's uh, let's take a look at the website and and get a little bit better of an idea. And I'll I'll zoom out of this a little bit so we can get a a better view of the entire website and we can kind of scroll through a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, the first thing that jumped out at, out at me when I. Um, looked at the website and started doing research on the company was, you know, this this particular statement that's right here in, on the screen right now. And that is, we pick up packages from your storefront and deliver them to your customers. So it really yeah. is pretty clear who you're marketing yeah. this service to. Pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, we're, we're not reinventing the wheel here, right? right? Um, yeah. There's no need for us to prove that electric cargo bike delivery works in a major city. It happens in other places all over the world very successfully. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we are not, you know, 
we, we didn't come up with this idea and we don't pretend that we did, right? Right, right. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, that's what we do, right? We, we move your package, we, we move your product from A to B um, or from B to B, right? So business to business, right? So we'll move inventory around between different stores as well. And, and at the end of the day, I, you know, what we are is we're a van replacement, right? right. We're, we're not a messenger service. We're not hot food delivery. Um, those are, you know, very beneficial to cities as well when they're done on a bike. Uh, but really what we do is we, we're trying to um, show people that there's a better way to do things, uh, especially in a dense city, than, than using a combustion engine van. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, if you go back to that, that homepage, that's that's uh, that's before that bike got uh, got branded properly, um, but uh, I mean that little short little video clip. I mean that says it all to me right there, right? right? How many vehicles? Look, we got a big truck, we got a van, we've got a bunch of cars with one person in them, mm-hmm. uh, and and they're all just they're all just sitting there in traffic waiting for <laughs> waiting for the light to change. Yeah, and you know there's one of our riders moving through the city quietly. Uh, carrying a whole bunch of uh, inventory, probably from a butcher store to another store. Um, no emissions, no noise, and, and it's moving quickly. Like this, this is, I truly believe this is better for a city. Uh, yeah. and, and this is a better way to do things. Yeah. And it also reinforces the fact that when we have a network of safe and inviting all ages and abilities facilities, this suddenly becomes that much more practical and possible for uh, for businesses and for individuals, uh, you know, for families. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, it just it all comes together. It's it's a hundred percent necessary. Um, well, I mean, could you do it? Could you do it without bike lane? Sure. I mean, we're we're yeah. also not the first bike courier company in Toronto either. There's, uh, you know, and. Um, yeah, you could get into traffic, you can weave in and out. Right. And sometimes we have to, because we, we don't have a completely connected network here, but I, I will say this city has made some good strides, especially since, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, you know, um, other cities have done a lot more, but we did, uh, we did get about 35, uh, new kilometers of protected cycling infrastructure, uh, around the city. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it certainly makes our life easier and we certainly take advantage of it. Uh, yeah. and, and the more we build, listen, I, I like, I, I want our company to be the best at what we do, but I want to see other people do this too, right? right? It's, it's better for the city. Um, and the more infrastructure that's built, the more confident other people might be to, to follow suit. Yeah. Yeah. I pulled up this page because uh, you had mentioned a, a couple of the, 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 the different uh, tactics of, of how you get things out. And specifically, a little bit further down on this page, you have your your hub and spoke, um, you know, yeah. and point to point as well. Talk a little bit about that from a logistics perspective for those people who, who may not be real familiar with, with how this works. Yeah, sure. And I should note, we have a logistics guy that is not myself, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I can certainly talk about this uh, for sure. So so what makes us a little bit different uh, and, and will be certainly more prevalent as, as we get bigger as a company is working on this hub and spoke model. Um, so what this means is, uh, you know, sim- similar to like a FedEx would now, uh, what we do is we collect uh, packages or product from one place. Uh, or a number of places, and we bring it back to a hub location in central Toronto. Uh, what that then allows us to do is disperse those packages amongst a number of different riders on very efficient routes, right? So rather than saying, okay, I got to go from here, and then I got to pick up here and then back, we centralize um, our pickups, and then we disperse um, based on the most effective way to move the bike around the city, right? So. You might pick up a package in the morning, but you're not necessarily delivering that later to the day or later in the day because you're not going to be in that part of a city, but you're dropping it off and another rider starting his shift or her shift. And, you know, um, it makes more sense for them to take it to where they're going. Uh, I I am as big a proponent of bikes as you're going to find. But the fact is at a certain point over a certain distance, a van still makes more sense than a bike, right? Um, but by using this model, once we, you know, can put a few different hubs around the city, 
you compress the distance that each bike needs to travel, uh, and but you can still cover a large amount of the city, right? So instead of having you know one bike travel 15k, it can move five, and then the next next bike picks it up to bring it to its its final destination, maybe another five kilometers away. Yeah, I had to chuckle a little bit because out on the website, it actually literally says first mile, last mile, you know, challenge. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. Why didn't he say first kilometer, last kilometer? Oh, yeah, no, I notice that every time, too. It's like, which one are we? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, yeah, I grew it's... up on the border myself, not in Toronto. And I, uh, I, I still I switch back and forth uh, between the. Uh, the metric and imperial system. Well, it's just, it, it's funny because it, it, I mean, the, the colloquialism, blah, blah, that was easy for me to say. <laughs> the saying, the, the terminology that's used is in this, in this world is always first mile, last mile challenge. First mile, last mile. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that is significant, especially in dense urban environments, especially yeah. in situations where having a big, huge delivery truck and, and frequently not carrying big, huge items. No. Maybe many smaller items. Um, and so having that opportunity to, to shift over to uh, an opportunity uh, to be able to make those, some of those deliveries. Maybe not all of them, as you mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. But it takes a little bit of that pressure off of the city. It takes, mm-hmm. it, and, and it does so in a way that's, that's much greener much cleaner for the the environment yeah. much quieter um and, and and again really takes advantage of the fact that you know when a city is investing in that protected infrastructure that safer network you can take advantage of that and then in my mind i'm already thinking okay logistically this is also something where cities need to be thinking through creatively about curbside management issues just like they yeah. had to start thinking that with um you know with the uh, the ubers and the lifts of the world and then the micro mobility yeah. devices of the world we're now starting to think about okay now how are we going to be able to do a better job of you know, facilitating easy delivery of these packages and having, you know, maybe some yeah. loading and unloading it, zones where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, again, bike lanes don't get blocked and, and, and it's also yeah. working in, and I'm sure that's one of those logistical things from an operations perspective you guys are, are dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of the conversation. I mean, I, I, I'm not speaking bad about Toronto. I, I think we're maybe a ways away from getting to that next step uh, of beyond just building a bike lane, right? Um, it's what, do you, you know, how do you facilitate uh, business happening in bike lanes? Just like you said, uh, I, I attended a fantastic webinar um, on Friday about cargo bikes for business. Uh, and the use cases for them and, you know, lots of stories from different uh, companies like us in England, you know, running into issues with not, you know, not having cargo bikes being allowed in certain loading bays at warehouses, right? Uh, Issues with with parking. Um, You know, we don't have a designated space. Uh, I've ridden those bikes into uh, loading bays at a a large market here in Toronto and, you know, you, you don't get treated as if you're a real delivery uh, company, right? Like I'll be, you know, I'm unloading the same place uh, a large truck is and I'll get asked to move. Right. And I'm like, well, we're doing, I'm doing the same thing you are. I just happen to be doing it in a bike. So there, there's a lot of mindset change that needs to happen, uh, both at a governmental level and, and on, on just a day-to-day uh, community level, I think, right. It's, it's still not normal here. Right. Um, it's, it's becoming more, uh, recognized. Um, but yeah, we're, we're certainly fighting for, for some of the basics, uh, that are, are, are taken for granted by people who, who use vehicles every day. Right. Um, so yeah, parking designated areas, we've got some, we've, I probably have a video on there somewhere, John, of, uh, trying to ride these bikes, uh, through some very narrow bike lanes. Oh, yeah. I've, just got, I've got an inch or two on either side. And, uh, you know, we we had a great meeting with uh, with a local um, 
uh, well, provincial or sorry, federal government uh, leader here in Toronto mm-hmm. last week. And, and she even mentioned this her, herself. She commutes to work and, you know, bike lane's great. And it's, it's great to have a family with their young kids biking there uh, in front of you um, or, or on their way to school. Um, but you can't pass. Right. Right. There's not enough space. It's still mainly devoted to to parking and, and, and to moving vehicles. Um, so it, it's more than just building the basic. It's it's makes it, making it functional uh, for all people that need to use it, whether it's you know young children or businesses making deliveries. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the the lessons that uh, the Dutch can speak to as well is that um, after you get to a, a certain point, you start to realize the limitations of the the infrastructure that you've built, and and then you mm-hmm. you're like looking at it, going, okay, you know we now need to continue, you know, that spirit of continuous improvement. We now need to, yeah. you know, either make the lanes wider or in the case of recently in, in Utrecht, they've, you know, they've gone through and removed the, the bike lanes and just turned the entire street into a bicycle street. street. Into a bicycle street. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, you know, it takes it to that next level of, of, <clears throat> of uh, you know, it's yeah. that next step in the evolution of, of the environment. So, yeah. When you look at your environment, so you, you've you've made this shift. You, you've come over in, into this uh, this new career path, and it, it started out originally as as like this sort of like a lark, and and, and yeah, yeah, that would be fun, good way to yeah. spend some time. But when you look at your environment there in the Toronto area, what would you most like to see, you know, happen moving forward that makes your business more relevant, but also makes life for the city better. What would you like to see happen? <laughs> How much time we got? Uh, no, um, I, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to bold political action uh, to promote active transportation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to badmouth my city. We, we do some great things here. I don't think we're all that different than a lot of other cities in this regard, but we certainly have a lot of officials who you know, we'll hashtag climate emergency or talk about green strategies or are just absolutely in love with electric vehicles 20, 30 years from now. Right. Um, I, I, we, we need to start acting now if, if we're going to make some serious changes in, in how cities work. Right. Um, I, 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 I'm not, um, I don't, well, I don't know. I don't know that the sky is not falling. It's. Uh, I, I do think that there is time. You know, there, there is time to make change, uh, but it's not going to happen by just talking about what might happen in the future on Twitter, right? Um, we need proactive programs that incentivize people changing the way that they move around a city, and we need to make it a sensible choice for them, right? You can't just tell people to go get on a bike. You can't just put some paint down and expect it to get used. Um, you can't build infrastructure and then not take care of it all four seasons uh, or let it deteriorate, right? So um, I 100% understand cycling is not the answer for every single problem or for every single person. Uh, but I, I, I think, um, you know, some, some real work in North America uh, has to go into making it a good choice for your everyday person, right? It has to make sense. It has to be easy. Uh, And and that gets done, as as you well know, uh, by building proper infrastructure so that you're not making a statement when you're on a bike. You're just getting on your bike because it's the best place to get to the next place that you got to go, right? Um, You've got to make it safe, uh, usable by all ages. And, you know, other things, to here, I know it's different in different states and provinces and cities, um, rebates for electric vehicles, but not for electric bikes, right? Like that's something to me uh, that is such a door opener for so many people who might not think of the bicycle as a means of transportation now. Yeah. Um, you know, forget my bike. Even the average, like just a regular run of the mill e-bike is thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's a hard choice to make for somebody who's never used one before, right? or just for a uh, 20 minute test ride at a bike shop to pop down that much money um, at full price, right? Let's incentivize 
uh, people financially and through other means to make these decisions. And then let's make that decision easy for them by giving them a place to ride that bike. Yeah, yeah. I want to kind of close this out by by going to where we started out, and 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 that's really you know this particular image, and um, because I think it just really encapsulates what's what's possible for the, for the future for you know cities uh, are, are around the country, around the world, around the globe, and that is you know getting to the point where you know this is normalized that you know you can just you know, decide that, hey, we're going to go out, have a great, uh, you know, evening dinner on the town and, you know, and we're going to get dressed up and we're going to, you know, head on out and and have a good time. And and that level of normalization that, you know, makes this so that it's not something that you even have to think about. And, 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 you know, and, 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 and quite frankly, you may choose to do a photo, but it, it's more like, you know, hey, passerby, would you mind just getting a, a photo of the two of us? Because, you know, yeah. you know, we're, well, we're I, out for I, a I wonderful think... evening and and we don't have to we don't, quote unquote, have to get out on bike Twitter and and, and talk about it. So that's right. ultimately where we want to get to is to the point where this isn't a thing. This is just the way we do stuff. Oh, John, I, you know, sometimes I, I almost wish I didn't get into some of bike Twitter and advocacy because there's a lot of times where I wish I could just go back to riding my bike and not thinking about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, just like you're saying, right. Yeah. Uh, and, and not thinking, oh, I better take a picture of myself carrying this right. or, you know, that sort of thing. I think I, I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it was important now. Cause I think people like me, uh, a couple of years ago, need to see it to believe you can do it. Right. But the goal exactly. would be to never have to do it. Right. 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 Well, and yeah. and, and and it's just like you know, you, with Brandon, um, you know, we've talked about him, you know, multiple times already this episode. He, you know, he's just eclipsed over ten thousand followers on Twitter, and wow. like it or not, you know, it's he's a storyteller. You are a storyteller. I'm a mm-hmm. storyteller, and we're all kind of telling the same story of. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if our cities were built for people and were welcoming so that, you know, active mobility was a choice that we could actually, you know, legitimately take advantage of? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the goal of all of this, I think, for sure. Well said. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Dave, is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you want to make sure we leave our, our listeners and also our viewers with? Um. No, I, I, I think um, if, if I've been asked that before on some other things. And, and I think what I usually say is, is, is it doesn't have to happen all at once if you don't do it now, right? Um, you're never going to commute to work four days a week if you don't do it one day a week, right? Um, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. And, and it's okay to just dip your toes in, right, and see how it feels. Uh, make some adjustments. And, and if it feels right, maybe do it a little bit more, right? But it, it's not a failure if you don't bike with an umbrella in the rain like they, they do in the Netherlands, right? Uh, maybe you don't bike that day, right? But maybe you leave the car at home on three other trips uh, and, and, and give yourself some time to, you know, um, understand what you can comfortably do and, uh, you know, um, and then keep doing it. Uh, and I, I think really at the end of the day, uh, you can talk about advocacy all you want. Um, the best advocacy is, is getting out on your bike and being seen riding. I love it. I love it. Dave, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Oh, thanks, John. It was a real, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode featuring Dave Edwards with Nearby in Toronto, Canada. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click that subscription button down below and uh, ring the notifications bell to indicate the preferences that you have for notifications. And two final reminders on how you can help support this channel. Uh, One, head on over to the Active Town store and check out some of my fun Streets Are For People swag. And secondly, please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page. Um, Again, any support you're able to provide really does help me in being able to produce this content and get it out to you. And uh, we've got some fun things coming up here later this summer and into the fall, including 
this is the first announcement, uh, I am going back to the, the Netherlands. So I'll be leading a study tour in conjunction with the International Cargo Bike Festival. So if you're interested in tagging along with me on that particular uh, study tour, uh, be sure to drop me a line. Again, my email address is john at activetowns.org. And uh, let me know if you might be interested in tagging along. And well, that's it. <laughs> so until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.